Hey everyone, Anarch here. This is another installment of Anarch Abridged, which is just a video series where I sit down and talk to the camera as opposed to those big long video essays that the channel really grew big on. But uh, this one is actually part two of a series of these Anarch Bridge that I've been doing uh, where I basically just go through a reading list that I've developed. Uh, if you are interested in just kind of like general anarchist texts, you'll want to just go over and watch part one of the video series, which uh, is mostly just me going through those, not necessarily like introductory texts, but just like texts that their focus is anarchist political theory. Um, this video will probably spend more of its time, uh, talking about, uh, uh, books that are uh, dealing with history. And if I have time, I might get started on the list for intersectionality or queer or tra uh, trans anarchism. Uh, that being said, the, uh, history section is pretty long. So I imagine that'll probably be the next part in this series. So, uh, so that I don't waste any more time so that I can actually like get to the, the, the reading list. Uh, I'm just going to get started on that. Um, first I'd like to just kind of like state, uh, the two that I got to at the end of the last video, because at the end of the last video, uh, I, I, I started on the history list and those two are seeing like a state by James C. Scott and the state, it's historic role by, uh, Kropotkin. And, uh, both of these are, as you can tell from the titles of the books, deal books dealing with the theory of the state. Uh, whereas seeing like a state is more a book that is about, um, uh, uh, like how the state functions to reduce complexity in society. Uh, the state, its historic role is Kropotkin really going over the history of the state. What is the state? Uh, how did it arise and how do we define it? And uh, this, uh, I would say is probably like one of uh, Kropotkin's best works, but it really never gets talked about. I actually uh, have quoted it uh, in my video, uh, my video series, The State is Counter-Revolutionary. I highly recommend it. And the other one, Seeing Like a State, I cannot recommend highly enough. It is, it has been cited in uh, several of my videos. So I would also recommend going over and uh, uh, reading that. But I'm not going to give any kind of longer uh, discussion of those because I already kind of talked about them at the end of part one. So if you're interested in hearing a little more at length about those two books, just go watch at the end of part one of, of this reading list. Uh, the next one I have on the list is Debt by David Graeber. Um, this book is, is, is pretty well known at this point. This, th the book is precisely what it says. It is the history of debt. And not only might I add debt in an economic sense, but even debt in a sort of like philosophic or, or a, a theological sense. So he really gives us a wide spanning coverage of the concept of debt. It is, uh, it was written within the context of, of like, um, uh, it was contemporary to like Occupy Wall Street. So this book is very modern right? Like this book was written very recently and, uh, a Graeber only, uh, passed away very recently. Uh, he was an anthropologist and, uh, one of the most notable anarchists, uh, who was, who, who was, uh, alive during our times. So debt is an excellent book. Debt, debt, no, uh, like I said, uh, goes not only in just the, the history of economic debt, which it does. It, it talks a lot about the, the history of economic debt, it also just kind of like goes into the where where debt came from as a concept. Where did it arise and how did it sort of get embodied within different societies? What, what were its sort of like precursors? What were the conceptual precursors that um, allowed debt to to become this this prevalent concept? It goes into uh, the history of how debt was thought of in a variety of societies. And that is to say, Debt was not always this thing that you were permanently burdened with. For example, there were there were societies that had you know what were called like uh, uh, um, 
I believe they're called debt jubilees. But there was this idea that every once in a while, what would happen is the power structure, the reigning power structure, recognizing that things could get wildly out of control if debt got too big, would just forgive, blanket forgive, enormous uh, swaths of debt. Um, and so it, it compares and contrasts that sort of uh, uh, those different treatments of debt with the modern treatment of debt. It's also actually a very good coverage of the, the, the um, origination of, of money. Where did money come from? Where did currency come from? It should be said. Uh, and it, it takes a position called chartalism which uh, is, is not necessarily orthodoxy, but is uh, not outside the realm of, of economic, like common economic theory. Uh, but uh, I highly recommend you read Debt. It is, it is somewhat dense at points. Uh, I think that many people I've spoken with sort of struggled with understanding where he was going with all of his all of his dialogue like where where he was aiming with each of them Be, uh, because Graeber has this tendency to sort of just like tell stories and talk about things and then expect you to come to your own conclusions uh, but I think you will get an enormous amount out of it. If you are interested in the concept of money, if you are interested in how societies that don't have money might function, if you're interested in the concept of debt, uh, uh, this is a book you should definitely read. The next in the list is another one by uh, David Graeber, but this time also co-authored with um, uh, David Wingrow. So David Wingrow is still alive. Uh, this was the last book that they wrote together called Dawn of Everything. So uh, I highly recommend Dawn of Everything, despite the fact that it's received some criticism, but it's to be expected that it will receive some criticism as it is... A, so, a sort of like surprisingly controversial book. And uh, the reason for that is that what they're trying to do is retell how we conceive of the history of humanity. <laughs> and I know that sounds like it's just an absurdly large task. And to a degree it is. It's a very thick book. It's big. It's like, it's like this thick, okay? Um, but it is a masterwork and there is, there's, um, things that can be criticized and I've heard some, some decent criticisms of different aspects of the dawn of dawn of everything, but it remains an excellent book that should be read by an enormous variety of different kinds of people. Um, one of the, one of the main things that takes place in dawn of everything is they're trying to push back against a variety of different conceptions about, um, where humanity came from and how human, humans acted historically. One of the big ones they're trying to push back on is that we sort of like were proceeding in this inevitable arc that the development of technology or the development of cities or the settlement in agricultural uh, uh, societies inevitably led us toward this arc of hierarchy and domination. They really want to push back on that concept. Um, this is also to say that they're trying to push back on both the noble savage myth, which is one problem, obviously, um, one way of seeing it where it's like, oh, we were in this idyllic state of nature and everybody got along and it was utopian. Um, and then um, uh, this sort of opposite viewpoint um, often uh, uh, provided by, by, by Hobbes, which is that the state of nature was brutish and nasty and short and uh, that it was, that it was uh, you know, pockmarked by terrible warfare, tribal warfare at all times. Um, what they really want to do is, is add a lot more complexity to early human history and to the arc of human history, to talk a lot about different kinds of cities that were developed that didn't follow this arc of domination, to talk about the situations where they did have agriculture and there was no, there were not, there was not the development of hierarchy. Um, they give all of these sort of like confounding uh, narratives and stories, uh, many of which go against the prevailing notions of, of, uh, uh, you know, dominant political theories. So it's going to be, it would be upsetting for liberals, but it's also going to be upsetting for fascists. It's also going to be upsetting for some anarchists, such as uh, primitivists. It's going to be upsetting for some Marxists who take the position that there's a sort of inevitable arc of history as per the development of the means of production. Um, it sort of 
pushes back against all of these notions, and it is therefore a somewhat controversial book, but I think it should be required reading for any modern leftist. Even if you end up disagreeing with it, you need to know what is in this book, and it has a lot of very strong arguments for their conception of history. Uh, the next one is um, uh, called The Anarchist Collectives by Dolgoff. Um, I sh it should be said that I've included uh, two books here that are about the Spanish Civil War. And I have included both of them for a particular reason. And that is, even though this one is a slightly, is slightly less in depth than the other one, this one is a lot more accessible and is a lot more widely read. It has been a lot more widely read. Uh, it, it, it even has some sort of, sort of like historical uh, importance to anarchists as lots and lots of anarchists cite the anarchist collectives or, or refer to events in it. Uh, the anarchist collectives is, uh, as I said, is a, a history book about the Spanish Civil War, the anarchist revolutionary constituency during the Spanish Civil War. And it gives very detailed accounts of what played out with the the collectivized, uh, you know, swaths of land that were controlled by the anarchists. It gives accounts of how the war played out. It gives um, a, a pretty detailed accounts of all kinds of things involving the economy and um, how the, the percentage of different of different structures played out. Uh, I find I find that it is a very good introduction to anarchism during the Spanish Civil War, and it is a key text in understanding anarcho syndicalism because this is sort of maybe the the um, height of anarcho syndicalism uh, within history. I would say this is the height of anarcho syndicalism within history. So a lot of people, a lot of anarchists have read the anarchist collectives historically, and it is continu continues to be read. Uh, I would consider it a a uh, um, you know, an important primary text uh, in anarchist history. Uh, the other one that is on the same topic is called Anarchism and Workers' Self-Management in Revolutionary Spain by Frank Mintz. Uh, the reason this one's also on the list, it is a little harder to find. I actually had to buy a physical copy in order to track it down. Um, but it is even more in depth. It is it is extremely comprehensive. It lays out detail. It lays out details like how money was structured in the anarchist collectives, um, how they mixed a fully communized or or a, a, you know direct distribution decommodified economy with also a sort of like market anarchist economy. It talks about how that that economy functioned differently in the urban centers and in the countrysides, and it talks about the um, uh, the successful uh, uh, productive regime that took place, the um, the success of, of uh, you know its economic success, the success of actually collectivizing large swaths of land, um, and also discusses the um, the the process of struggle and conflict that took place within urban centers, uh, and th this is. Something that is often sort of covered in a, in a more general sense, like there are plenty of books you can find, but it is, I would say, the most comprehensive uh, coverage of, of each of these things that I, I've run across. Uh, I highly recommend it if you can get a physical copy and if you're interested in the Spanish Civil War. I think to this day, even though people might have like valid criticisms of anarcho-syndicalism, uh, the, the, the anarchists in the Spanish Civil War remain one of the most developed examples of anarchism in the real world that has ever existed. And there is a lot for us to learn. And it is not only cautionary tales. There's a lot of positive examples for us to look at about how the Spanish anarchists during, before and during the, the Spanish Civil War, uh, uh, carried out, uh, created an anarchist society within the belly of, uh, of, a uh, of, you know, a liberal Republic and, uh, simultaneously fought a war against, uh, rising fascism. 
So I think that these these books are included because this the CNT FAI, which is the name of the of the the big federation that what represented the anarchists during the Spanish Civil War is one of the most important anarchist projects to ever exist. And so I was pretty well obligated to include some important texts on the uh, CNT FAI and their development during the Spanish Civil War. The next one on the list is A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. This one is just sort of a staple text of the left. <laughs> um, I feel like there's a decent chance that you, even if you're not super informed about political theory, you might have heard of this book, A People's History of the United States. It is a very important book. It has been widely read outside of even leftist circles, um, outside of, of uh, you know, outside of radical circles generally, this book has seen wide, uh, wide uh, readership. And I still highly recommend it. This book was one of the oldest sort of radical history books that I ever read. I read it back in the early on in my journey when I was going through Occupy. And it was, it was a very, very informative. It gave me, it gave me a lot to think about. It is it, it sort of informed a lot of my, uh, my early understanding of, of U.S. history. So what is the book about? Well, it's called A People's History of the United States because uh, Howard Zinn was an anarchist historian. And anarchist history is predicated around trying to tell the story, uh, the, the historical narrative, but from the position of those who are oppressed, not from the position of the oppressors. It is a sort of refutation of, um, you know, the victors telling the history. Instead, what, what Zinn has done is each chapter, he has chosen an era of U.S. history, and he tells it from the position of those who were, you know, most oppressed, or perhaps not most oppressed, I don't want to rank them or anything, but, you know, who were the key oppressed peoples during that time. And so it talks, it's from the position of, of uh, indigenous Central and North Americans um, in the, the early settling, uh, or rather Central Americans during the, during the, the time when Columbus and the, and the Spaniards showed up. Uh, then it moves into North America, telling from the position of indigenous peoples there. It tells it from the position of black people during, uh, during the time of slavery. It tells it from the position of laborers. It tells it from the... Um, a variety of different positions throughout history. So it is, you might say, like the antidote to to the victors telling telling history. It is it is a, a radical history from the bottom up. And there is a lot. I mean, it's sad to say, but there's a lot in this book that you know, you're just never going to learn in a classroom. You're not going to learn in mainstream history. It, it, it is very informative as to what, what the United States really is and where it really came from and how it has really treated the oppressed peoples uh, uh, throughout history. And uh, I got to say, it is not a positive account. Um, the next one in the list is Mutual Aid by Kropotkin. So you may notice, uh, you know, we've got more than one entry by Kropotkin here, and that's because Kropotkin focused a lot on history. Like, he, he, he gave us, you know, he, he, he did a lot of writing which um, uh, involved historical accounts. So whereas the state, its historic role was about the history of the state, and you might say it was kind of the history of the rise of a hierarchy, this is the, the opposite. This is kind of the counterpoint to that. Mutual aid is Kropotkin telling us sort of like the natural history of cooperation. This book, I, can, I could not conceivably exaggerate to you how important this book is. And I don't only mean that like in that it's important to anarchists. This book was a significant work in the history of evolutionary biology. Like this, this was the, at the time it was written and published, the strongest argument for the cooperative impulse being a driving impulse in evolution. And I know that may seem shocking now, but like, during the time he was writing, the broad conception of what Darwin thought revolution or evolution was is, uh, uh, you know, his conception of this, this phrase, survival of the fittest, right? 
of course, now there's complications to that. What what is what is what makes something fit, right? And that's kind of like uh, uh, the topic that Kropotkin is is trending us towards. Uh, but there was this dominant narrative by um, uh, by Herbert Spencer, which is that you know it's kind of this Hobbesian concept from just a minute ago that you know nature is brutish and, and is based in domination and hierarchy and things you know um, a competition right that evolution takes place through competition. What Kropotkin is doing here, and it's it's notable because he himself was a practicing field biologist is he is giving an enormous number of cases, both in nature and in human society, where the dominant feature that is driving forward the way things function is cooperation. So this is an impassioned uh, defense of the fact that cooperation is actually what leads to the flourishing of most species, and that the species that do best are the ones that cooperate best. The, the, the species that, that function on hierarchy and domination, those aren't the apex species. And it gives plenty of accounts by, um, of how that cooperation is actually what did, what did the work in bringing many of these very successful species to a position of, uh, uh, you know, at the height of their ecology at being one of the most successful species in their ecology. It is cooperation that brought them there and not domination, not competition. Um, this is not to say that he like, denies the importance of competition in evolution because that would be absurd. It's instead just to say that the species which do best, including humans, are actually species which cooperate very well. And this is in fact where the term mutual aid, which of course we are all very familiar with now, this is where it came from. This book is what developed the foundational theory of what mutual aid means historically. And um, uh, so it remains an extremely important work. And, you know, I've talked a lot about evolution in, in animals um, uh, or non-human animals, but it also talks about the the um, principles of cooperation in early human societies, taking us from, you know, quote unquote, primitive societies up through, uh, you know, uh, tribal societies and through clan society and through the medieval period and so on, giving us examples of how humans have always cooperated in order to in order to survive. So it is an extremely important book. And I got to say, reading a lot of political theory is often extremely dour. This this is the opposite. It is it is extremely relieving. It is ex it is it is like a breath of fresh air. It's 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 just endless accounts of animals and beings cooperating in order to survive. So it's a wonderful book, um, even if sometimes kind of dense. The next one in the list is the Bolsheviks and Workers' Control by Maurice Brinton. Um, this one. Probably not a lot of people have read, but for me, this book was very important. You know, I couldn't tell you really how I stumbled across it. I don't really remember, but it is precisely what it says. It's an account of the interaction of the Bolsheviks and workers' control, but specifically between the years of like 1917 and I think it's like 1923 or something. So right, uh, like, like, just preceding the 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 revolution the february revolution through into the events between the february and october revolution um, and uh, then uh, proceeding into the years uh, d you know right there during the the uh, civil war the russian civil war um, and it the reason why it's here, because of course there are just a huge number of texts that talk about those events, right? Like, why is this the one I included? The reason I included this one is because I think it's the it's the text on those events that that the most of any text um, it excludes like editorializing. Britain is not giving his opinion on things here. I mean, briefly he does once or twice. No, Britain is day by date, date by date, okay, year by year, he is telling us what happened. This, this thing, you know, it's, it's so dry. It's like, you know, February of, of February 23rd, 2017, you know, uh, a draft decree is created and such and such and such. You know, it's, it's extremely to the point. It says precisely what it means at every single step. And this book was very important for me because 
when I just had the facts in front of me and there was no editorializing and there was no valorizing of what was taking place, this book is the one that really gave me the best understanding of what took place in that, in that, that period right after the war. And it really demonstrates the degree to which the Bolsheviks were counter-revolutionaries, not revolutionaries. They were actually the main driving force in destroying worker management, uh, worker self-management in uh, uh, post-revolutionary Russia. And it, it is not like, it's not a matter of question. After you've read it, you can see that there's not a question about it. It's just a fact. Um, it gives, and, and it's, it's extremely unbiased in that it's giving accounts from all kinds of different angles, angle from the workers. It's, it's got, you know, accounts from the workers. It's got uh, accounts from magazines and newspapers that were, that were publishing at the time. It's got accounts from, from, from labor delegates and from, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, people who had been uh, appointed to go analyze and assess what was taking place in the Soviets from the Central Soviet. So, like, these were people that by all means you would expect to be, or, you know, in some occasions, there were people that you would expect to be at least to some degree uh, uh, f uh, flattering of, of the Bolsheviks, flattering of the, of the central state apparatus. And yet they still had to come to the conclusion that what had really happened was the dissolution of worker control and its replacement with a central state apparatus and its control. Therefore, the creation of what we would call state capitalism, not socialism. And uh, so I, I highly recommend it. It's really not super long. It's a, and it's extremely straightforward. It is not hard to understand. It says precisely what it means at every step. So highly recommended. Um, I now we are coming around to what I think is probably uh, one of my favorite books on this entire list. Uh, for me, this book was extremely influential. Uh, I'd even be willing to say it changed my life. And that is Nationalism and Culture by Rudolf Rocker. So what is nationalism and culture about? Nationalism and culture is about what its name says, okay? It's about the interaction of nationalism and culture. But I should be more specific here because what Rudolf Rocker is talking about by nationalism is more appropriately sort of like statist nationalism, right? We could have a bigger conversation about what nationalism is and so on. He's really talking about this centralizing tendency of, of nationalism. He's talking about how nationalism is all tied up in the creation of the state apparatus and in propping up the state apparatus and so on. And by culture, he's really talking about that organic, those organic created things of the, of the people, um, you know, their art and their language and, and every, you know, every aspect, the, their, their, um, you know, tendencies and their, their mythologies and their stories and their, and, you know, their sayings and their, 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 you know, their knowledge of the landscape and so on. Those are the things he's calling culture. So what he's really talking about in this book is he's talking about how there is an inherently antagonistic relationship between hierarchical power structures and that organic development of the powers of human beings. And that might sound like a very radical thesis, but it is in fact one he argues to a prolific extent. He gives an enormous number of examples throughout history. The only thing I can really say um, is that they're mostly European examples. So he doesn't give us a lot of examples of, of Africa or indigenous America. You know, he really he kind of lacks a lot of examples in that capacity. But the he is at the same time at the as he's giving us these these historical examples, he is giving us these beautiful eloquent prosaic passages where he is bearing forth deep theory about hierar how hierarchical power functions and and the these beautiful passages you know praising the development of organic culture and really talking deeply about this interplay um i've said before and i'll say it again I think that I'd read anarchist theory before nationalism and culture, but it was nationalism and culture that I think solidified the foundations of anarchism for me. It made it to where 
I think that after reading nationalism and culture, I was going to be an anarchist for the rest of my life. And there was really nothing that could change. It wouldn't matter now, now that I understand what Rudolf Rocker was saying. And, and he, he conveyed it in such a way that it finally like truly clicked and made sense that there's really no going back, I don't think. I think this book was, was that important to me. So I would really like to recommend it to anybody who's looking for maybe kind of like, not like super advanced, but somewhat advanced theory that is mixed with, with dense historical accounts and beautiful prose. I think Rudolf Rocker has some of the most beautiful prose of any theoretician you will ever find. Some of the passages that are in there are, are some of my favorite passages ever written. So we have run short of me being able to finish the history section here. So I'm going to finish it in the next video. Uh, you know, part of me is kind of glad we got to end on nationalism and culture because it is a very important book to me. And I would really like to emphasize to you that it is worth a read for you. Um, and for anybody who watches the channel, you'll probably notice that I have, I've quoted it in like so many videos. I can't even number them. I think it's like literally six, it's five or six videos. Anyway, uh, that is it for today. Uh, if you like the video, go like it. If you have anything you'd like to uh, uh, comment on or any suggestions for future Anarch Abridged, uh, when I'm done with this reading list series, I'm going to be going back to suggestions. I would like to emphasize that if you are a patron on my Patreon, I will emphasize or I will prioritize the suggestions that you make, uh, which of course leads me to the next part, which is if you want to support the work that I'm doing on this channel, go become a patron uh, on my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash anarch and that will be down in the description lastly this reading list along with as many links as i could find to the texts is also down in the description uh and uh, i think that's it i think i got everything covered there if i forgot anything i'm sorry but uh, uh next week i will be continuing on through my reading list i will finish up the last couple history books here and then i will move into our next topic which is intersectionality queer and trans anarchism so i hope you'll join me for that and uh, i'll talk to you all soon